Great. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the American Library in Paris's virtual evenings with an author series. I'm Catherine Olin, Programs Manager at the Library. For those of you who don't know who we are, we are the biggest English language lending library on the continent. We're also a nonprofit, so we're completely independent. Uh, we don't receive government funding from either the US or, the, or France. And so we rely to a great extent on the generosity of our donors and our community. So thank you to those in the audience who are members, donors, and even to those of you discovering us for the first time, you're more than welcome. And we'd love to see you when you're able to, to travel to visit us. Um, I should also mention that we are open currently for curbside lending. So although France is in confinement uh, for another We'll see how long. Actually, Macron will be announcing in about half an hour <laughs> whether those uh, will have any sort of um, lifting of some of our restrictions. But in the meantime, the library does remain open, but you need to make an appointment online to reserve books. Um, we're also 100 years old. So we've been around since 1920 and we've had a really exciting year celebrating our centennial, although we've had to do so mostly in confinement. We had a virtual gala in October. I think some of you joined us for that and it was, uh, it was just fantastic. Um, so tonight, of course, uh, let me just find, excuse me. Tonight, of course, we're, we're very excited to be hosting Scott Carpenter. He teaches literature and creative writing at Carleton College in Minnesota. Winner of a Mark Twain House Royal Nonsuch Prize, Nonsuch Prize uh, and a Minnesota State Arts Board Grant, he's the author of Theory of Remainders, novel and of This Jealous Earth stories. His shorter work has appeared in a wide variety of venues, including South Dakota Review, The Rumpus, Silk Road, Catapult, and others. Tonight, uh, Scott will be interviewed by Erin Byrne. She is the award-winning author of Wings, Gifts of Life, Gifts of Art, excuse me, Life and Travel in France, editor of Vignettes and Postcards from Morocco, and Vignettes and Postcards from Paris, and the writer of the Story Keeper film. She is travel writing and photographer, photography curator of the Creative Process Exhibition, and has taught writing at Shakespeare and Company in Paris, Book Passage Bookstore, and on deep travel trips. So I'm delighted to be joined by both Scott and Aaron tonight who are in the Zoom room with us. And I'll hand it over to Aaron now for an interview. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you everyone for Zooming in from all these different time zones. Scott Dominic Carpenter, congratulations. On thank you. French thank you. like moi, a Midwesterner in Paris. As Publishers Weekly put it, you really do have a knack for turning potential catastrophes into comedy. <laughs> Can you uh, introduce your book to us? Uh, sure, yeah. So, um, you know, I think the Publishers Weekly thing says it all, right? That it just, it's a story of one catastrophe after another. And maybe what I'll do just to give people a little sense of the flavor of it is uh, give the opening page or two that, um, is an illustration of the kinds of encounters that um, uh, that the book really uh, revels in. Uh, so the the book opens with a chapter called "Murders in the Rue Bobbio." It has to do with uh, my uh, wife and me deciding that we're going to settle in uh, Paris and uh, we're looking to buy an apartment. To be honest, Madam C replied in French, "The problem is the neighbors. They refuse to die." the comments at my tea gurgling down the wrong pipe while I hacked and wheezed our hostess pinched her brow with concern her sandy haired partner Patricia tendered a napkin in case my insides came out ça va monsieur carpenter ça va I croaked flapping my hand to keep her at bay repeating it seemed a good idea ça va ça va Anne who'd been off inspecting the kitchen returned to the living room for the chore of pounding her husband on the back Madame C watched from the sofa and Patricia added cubes of sugar to their tea. The mood was far from homicidal. This kind of situation occurred with distressing frequency in Paris. I'd start a conversation on one topic only to find it veering into another. While I squinted at the butcher's explanation about cutlets, the road would somehow fork off to plumbing. At the post office, I'd be learning about airmail options only to feel the clerk had hairpin to the subject of Etruscan pottery. Swerves like this generally meant I'd misunderstood some crucial word, had careened off the conversational cliff, and had gone airborne for an undetermined amount of time. So when Madame C mentioned murder as the reason for selling their apartment, 
I recognized the floating sensation and braced for impact. Where, I wondered during the fall, had I gone wrong? After all, the verb mourir had definitely whizzed by, calling to mind the deathiness of mortgages and mortuaries. And I was pretty sure she'd said something about neighbors. Now, of course, there had been a slew of other words, too, some of them possibly significant. It's always hard to tell which parts of a foreign language are the engines and axles, and which are the hood ornaments and air fresheners. Sometimes if you play along, you can avoid a crash landing. So why do you suppose that is, I said. I mean, why is it the neighbors won't? And here I made a rolling gesture with my hand, inviting Madame C to fill in the gap with a clarifying comment. She shrugged. It was inexplicable. Monsieur and Madame Poutard were old and infirm, but they simply refused. You mean they refused to... My hand swirled. They refused to partir, she said. That is, to leave. Like, to an old folks' home? No. Her look went steely. To the grave. <laughs> Thank you for that. Sure. When you moved from Minnesota to Paris, I love how you just sort of dove off the high dive right into the deep end of Paris life. In a way, you and I have had opposite experiences. Like I have gone for a month at a time, you know, frequent visits a month at a time, but I usually would immediately don my rose colored glasses and then have them knocked off when I splatter on the cobblestone. And you, you were like a sleuth, tearing down walls, <laughs> venturing into the bureaucracy, descending into the catacombs, and even presenting your med Midwestern version of Coca Van. How brave <laughs> of you. Midwest book review called French Like Moi, a literary tango between Paris and the Midwest. So first for this, for the audience members who are in Paris, can you tell us about the Midwestern US, that undefinable swath of land and what distinguishes a Midwesterner from other Americans? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Also a very hard question, right? Because um, nobody actually, so this is the big secret. You shouldn't share it with anybody. Nobody actually knows what the Midwest is. You know, you can look it up in Wikipedia and you look it up in various sources and they all refer to something different. Um, and some places define it geographically, right? It goes from like Cincinnati to uh, Lincoln, Nebraska or something like that. And, uh, and you can even think, so you can think about it uh, horizontally or vertically, uh, north, south, east and west. It doesn't, it definitely doesn't extend to Texas Right? for whatever reason, nobody can explain. Um, but, but actually, it seems not really to be linked that closely to geography. It's more kind of a mindset and a sense of tradition. So it's certainly the kind of heartland and the flyover country and everything else. But the Midwest is, the Midwest is basically where everybody goes for Thanksgiving, right? It's that, that image they have of of uh, like going back to the country, going somehow to uh, the, the core of America. But it's also got this reputation for being, I don't know, sort of like plain spoken, a little uh, staid, uh, maybe a little dull, um, sometimes a little slow. And um, uh, so that's comparing it to other parts of the US, but it's also comparing it to like a place like Paris, which has exactly the opposite uh, sort of, um, I don't know, uh, aspect to it, right? People think of Paris as being chic and cosmopolitan and sophisticated and exotic and erotic and, and all of those other things. So uh, one of the joys of uh, the Midwest is that it is the opposite, at the kind of cultural opposite or the imaginary opposite of Paris. And in the book, what I want to do is throw those two things together and see what kind of sparks fly. All right. Thank you. We're going to be talking a little bit more about the Midwest and Paris later okay. on. I wanted to uh, talk about a few of these chapters. The first one is called The Squirrel Pie and the Golden Derriere. Yeah. And it is the winner of the second place Mark Twain House 
royal non such prize, and I right. love the, the name of that. Uh, I'm really intrigued here about your perspective on knowing things. So I wanted you to read um, from that chapter if you can. Sure. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so the, the chapter is all about the, um, the French versus the American way of knowing things and it has a little bit to do about education. Um, and so I'll just read a couple of paragraphs that encapsulate a little bit of this. Um, as a kid, whenever I told my dad more than he wanted to hear, he'd cut me off. Just tell me the time, he'd say, not how to build a watch. Sometimes I like to imagine how dad would have fared stranded in France, where they don't merely tell you how to build that watch, but also how to design it, how to smelt the metal for the cogs, and how to make that ticky noise, all before wrapping up with an explanation of how minutes are tied to the rotation of the planet. You could kind of understand this if the person you're talking to happens to be a watchmaker, but here it's just as likely to be an Uber driver or a male woman. People take pleasure in teaching you about things, and if you're a foreigner, their eyes close happily as they open each sentence with, in France, should the conversation turn to certain national subjects, cheese, for instance, or wine, sausage, colonialism, World War II, steel hold ships, or atomic energy, you want to stand back so you don't get splashed by their enthusiasm. Thank you. <laughs> there are a few other quotes that you have about this topic that I wanted to read. Um, you say, well, French kids were busy pasting hard-earned stamps into the pages of their knowledge albums. In the US, we just made things up. And also you mentioned later, you talk about the Cartesian method and you say that you, when you have a problem, it's like you swat at a fly and the French dissect it. And I thought that I love that. I think that's just a really great description of this difference. Uh, you say that Americans have this a la carte mentality where we get to choose. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how that's kind of coming to the fore right now in, in, in France and in the US. Uh, I was actually in Paris in February and March and then did this sort of last minute, I fled back to the US when, when the coronavirus squealed into town. And I remember watching the TV and watching Macron explaining what the pandemic was and what the plan was. And I felt like, wow, I'm in this place and there's one person defining this and everyone who's watching is believing him. And then I flipped to CNN and I realized, and when I go back to the States, it's gonna be that a la carte mentality, right? It's gonna be this whole different thing. Now I have asked, I've spent the last week asking my friends who, my Parisian friends, you know, like, what is it, what's going on there with, with COVID? Is it like, um, you know, everybody has their own story or does everyone agree on what the precautions are and, and the information about the virus? And most people said that there was agreement and that people were being careful, except for at the very last minute this morning, uh, my journalist friend, there, Karen, who is one of the, she's really one of the people who most enjoys removing my rose colored glasses. She said, no, we've had people here talking about um, hydroxychloroquine and we've had all this fake news here too. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering this a la carte mentality. I think it's just, it's gone sort of rampant here at present. Um, everybody has their different idea about what kind of mask they should wear. Uh, you know, this week, people seem to even have a different idea about who's won the election. Right. <laughs> so I wanted you to talk a little bit about, you know, just about that contrast. <laughs> and also your daughter, your daughter also went to school there. So also maybe bring her experience in there too. Okay, wait, wait, how much time do we have here? Let's see, I, well, I might need a couple of hours for this. But uh, 
no. So I'll, I'll take a, a little bit. <laughs> I'll take a crack at it. Um, you know, so of course these are these are oversimplifications, right? So the, the French are not just like super disciplined, always following a particular rigid order, um, and um, you know, sort of submitting themselves to the orders from on high. And we'll talk about that too, right? So there's chaos reigns supreme in many ways in France, um, but uh, but there is something like very uh, centralized about about knowledge, about government and everything else in France. It goes back to like 1700. And you look at the uh, the roads that, that Louis XIV was uh, emanating like like the rays of the sun right from Paris going throughout the country. And that's also then how the railroad ro railroads were designed and everything else. There was a single kind of source for you know economic power and cultural power and, and uh, political power and, and everything else which has certain benefits, um, I suppose, because when one person says something, you don't have, as in the US, like 50 other people saying something somewhat different or entirely different. So there's not as much of a battle over the, over the discourse, um, I think, in, in France. And that also is true with the educational system. So the squirrel pie and the golden derriere um, story, which is really all about how knowledge is um uh kind of cultivated and developed in france it all comes from the educational system which is also extraordinarily centralized um there was this dream at one point it was it was sort of napoleon's dream when he started the the lycée the high schools in france that on any given day uh throughout france school children everywhere should be reading the same page of the same book uh so this was uh this notion that everybody should have really the same educational experience whereas in in uh, uh in the u.s you know i sometimes joke with people and say oh you know how much you know, france spends uh, x percent of its budget on its uh, ministry of education how much do you think the u.s spends it's like well we don't really have a ministry of education we don't have a national education uh system it's all like divvied out to states and municipalities and you know, whatever this particular school board decides is going to be um, useful or interesting or should be censored or which books should be burned and, and things like that. Um, so I think it's part of the uh, the churn of the American federalized system uh, mm -hmm. that creates a bunch of this. And then uh, this notion that there is maybe in some strange way and, and the imperfect way, uh, France speaks more with a single voice. In, in some of these areas. Um, yeah, and for, I think that my, sometimes, yeah. sometimes I think it has a lot to do with the self versus the collective group. Yeah, you know? right. Well, I mean, that's partly because in, in France, so part of it is, you know, principles and Republican ideals, uh, re Republican in the French sense of Republican ideals. Um, but it is also the sense that there's more of a collective experience in France, yeah. Uh, yeah. whereas in the US, like less and less, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, you were asking about my daughter. I think my daughter, who was uh, over the years ping-ponging back and forth between the French system and the American system, you know, sort of learned how to play both of those games of right. uh, the the kind of rote memorization, and we're all learning sort of the same thing uh, that happens in France versus the let every flower bloom mentality that we have in the in the U.S. Interesting. Oh, thank you. Uh, the next chapter I wanted to tackle here is called War of the Worlds. Yeah. And it's about encountering a protest when you're on your way to pick up your daughter right. from school. And I've definitely noticed that protests in Paris are kind of an art form. And, you know, the, the history of France just comes into this, I think, so strongly with the market women marching out to Versailles with their pikes and strikes all through history. And sometimes I've discovered that it's more of a choreographed dance between the police and the protesters. Right. So I wanted you to read a little bit from this chapter. Sure. Right. So this comes from uh, the the middle of this uh, this essay where I'm talking about just trying, it's an episode where I'm trying to get to uh, my daughter's school to pick her up. And uh, one of these fairly large protests is underway. And it's one of the ones that 
because uh, you know sometimes these start out start out being like somewhat jolly. There's this vocabulary that's used for protests, right? So it's sort of bonhomme, and it's like oh everybody's having a good time, and but then sometimes they turn, and so this one was turning into something somewhat uh, somewhat violent, um, and uh, so I'm just wondering how my daughter would be reacting to all of this. What, I had to wonder, would she learn from this scene? French children of this age are the opposite of revolution. While American kids clown around and squirm in their seats, their French counterparts learn discipline. Starting in the first grade, they practice sitting straight for long stretches, controlling not just their bodies, but even their minds. They learn moral tales by heart, edifying rhymes about how much better it is to be a workaday ant than a tuneful cicada or how crows will drop their camembert if they talk with their mouth full. All is order. Then these kids enter the cocoon of middle school and emerge as revolutionaries, eager to take down the man and earn their freedom. While American high schools work to let every flower bloom, French students experience education as the Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> I love that, thank you. So, you know, I, I love in the book also how you really acknowledge and sort of bring forth this idea that the history there infuses the people and the daily life. And I started thinking about the history here in the States. And, you know, you had the um, Black Lives Matter protests really started in Kenosha, Wisconsin. So right there in the Midwest. And, you know, our, it, in the US, like our history, our revolution wasn't so bloody as the French. Um, our protest of tossing the tea in Boston Harbor, you know, we own that. But it's really like Martin Luther King and the civil rights protest that is very rich in our history. And that I felt this summer and fall sort of came into, you know, we're the toddler country, right? We're, we haven't been around very long. So so I felt like the, the history of, of those marches sort of came to the fore here at this time. And I just wondered if your Midwestern town, uh, you say in the book that, that like your protests in your town consisted of aging hippies. So I wondered, if the Black Lives Matter protest came to your town and you also, uh, you have a shirt, you can tell us about your shirt. I wondered if you brought that out and went protesting. And I also wondered what your daughter thought of the protests here. Yeah, okay, uh, more complicated questions, but you know, multiple uh, facets to it. But um, I, I guess I'll just start with the explanation about the shirt, which is that, uh, so this was several years ago when I was, so I've got friends in, in Paris who, um, who attend protests sort of as a form of, I mean, partly it's like civic engagement, but it's also like entertainment. What, what are we going to do today? Um, you know, what movies are showing? Is there anything good at the, um, at the theater? No, let's, let's do the protest. Uh, so they look up to see what the protests are and they go out. And sometimes I go with them. And at one of the particularly um, like uh, massive protests, and uh, it was actually back when Jean-Marie Le Pen uh, made it to the, the second round of, of voting. Uh, so I went out with them, masses of people, all right? They were like, depending on who was counting, a million people. And, and I bought this t-shirt that's that had in like bold red letters, uh, starkly painted as if like from blood, it said, no, right? This is standing up against. So it's like, oh, great t-shirt. And, and it's like, I would trot this t-shirt out for every possible protest. And then I had this brainstorm and I thought, oh, what I really need to do to cover all of my bases is I need to get the corresponding t-shirt that says we, but nobody <laughs> sells them because nobody protests for things. They're always protesting against things. Uh, so so I've, I've got this t-shirt that I get to trot out. Um, and, but then, so going, bringing this back to more contemporary things, uh, the, so the town that I lived in at the time that I was, uh, finishing the book and everything, Northfield, Minnesota, just south of the Twin Cities, a college town. And now I should say I'm, I'm actually in St. Paul. That's where I'm, uh, that, that's where I'm zooming from. And um, not too far from the George Floyd protest areas, right? So this, these, were, these were big events and um, uh, big events here, but then that rippled across the country. And um, so everybody was out 
either uh, protesting or looking or or witnessing, you know, whatever the particular uh, position position was. Um, so at that point, it wasn't these were not organized things. No call for the for the T-shirt uh, per se, I would say. Um, but it's still very different, I think, from what happens in France, where there is there tends to be this fairly high level of constant buzz. Right, this idea that there, I mean, there are always protests going on every day in Paris. There, there is a protest. You can go, you can look at the, there are strikes, right? You can go to the C'est la Grève website. And it's like, oh, where are the strikes today? You can check out where the, uh, the Manif routes are. So they, oh, it's like, I shouldn't go there because there's going to be a demonstration. I guess I'll go around this way. Um, and it's just like fairly high energy. And in the U.S., it seems that there is, I don't know, it's just hard to get Americans out of their barca lounger. And um, uh, but when it happens, then it can be quite explosive. Uh, so I think that's kind of what we were witnessing again uh, this year. It doesn't happen very often, but uh, yeah, but it, yeah. I've been envious in a way. I mean, not always because the strikes interrupt your daily life, but like I've right. been envious of that passion, and I just felt like, whoa, we got a little bit of that here, you know. Um, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Okay, so I told Scott that I had a little surprise trick that I was going to pull on uh, him, and he was he was a really good sport, and uh, so far. I, gave, I gave him a chance to know about this ahead of time, and he declined. So um, the Twin Cities Pioneer Press says that you were, it, they talk about your delightful cast of Parisian characters. And so you you were from the smaller town in Northfield, so I think I'm going to let you choose. You can waver between answering each of these for, you know, the bigger city or the smaller town in the Midwest. But I found myself wondering what would happen if a few of your Parisians were moved over and plopped into the Midwest <laughs> and what what they would find odd or what they would think <laughs> and i've had this experience now just moving i just moved from california to washington and i have my license tabs expired and so i've been in communique with the dmv here and i have finally i couldn't get through to make an appointment i couldn't get through on the phone i couldn't get through their automated system and i was answering the same you know, the questions. And so I finally got through to this email system and I have this long thread of a conversation, at least 15 back and forths about how I can make an appointment to get into the DMV to get my license tab. And every single time the it's the same person, I am saying, I can't get through to your system. And every single time she's answering, put this information in. And it's the information I've already put in. So finally, finally, I just said, okay, look, I'm going to take a picture of this conversation. If I get pulled over, I'm just going to show the cop, right? <laughs> but, I, but I wondered then, it led me to wonder if, uh, if Brigadier, as we would say, DeVoe, like what would happen? You could talk a little bit about him. What would happen if, he, if we took him into a DMV and he, he had to <laughs> maneuver that yeah uh so first just a word of explanation the uh the brigadier devoe uh thing just for people who haven't read the book it's from a chapter where i encounter um i'm actually brought into a police station real story um for a an irregularity with my visa we'll say um and i see somebody chatting on uh putting on the chat what's the Sorry. what is a dmv <laughs> department of motor vehicles department of motor vehicles uh, so this is the like the quintessential administrative uh, hell, right? In in most of the U.S., people refer to the DMV. Um, of course, the DMV is a little bit different from the administration. French love their bureaucracy too, but in French bureaucracies, there's there are often workarounds, right? You have trouble with this person, you go and you see that person. You go, you know, there's going to be somebody else there during lunch hour, and so you go during lunch hour. There all those sorts of things. And it's actually harder to get around the system, in a sense, in the in the U.S. I think, as your uh, your example <laughs> illustrates, right? Uh, but this idea of like parachuting in a Parisian 
into uh, the, the wilderness of the Midwest and, and then like observing them to see what becomes of them. It's a little bit like the Hunger Games, right? You drop them in yes. and, and see if they're going to be able to survive. Um, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I have, I have. Can I interrupt and then yeah. just let you riff? Like I just had a list, but and I'll give you a few <laughs> ideas of my and then I'm going to let you just go to town on this. Um, you know, like the lady supervisor at City Hall who gave you up. Um, yeah taking her to a town hall meeting where like everybody weighs in on the rules <laughs> uh, or Jerome taking him from the hardware store in Paris to a Home Depot. Oh um, my God. Yeah. You joined your condo board and so you write extensively about your adventures with the condo board and I wondered what they would do at a meeting of an HOA in like a fancy neighborhood when everyone is talking about the height of the fences. Right. Um, and then also your friend Sabine, uh, I wondered, maybe she has been to the States and you have taken her to like your favorite hometown restaurant, but I thought that would be interesting. So I'm just, and if you don't, you know, if you can think of other examples, just yeah. go to, go ahead. But I, I thought it would be fun to ask you this. So great. So, so somebody uh, in the chat asked what an HOA is, the Homeowners Association. Right. Yeah. And uh, so maybe I'll start with that, because in, in Paris, we, we buy this apartment and then I find myself you know, obviously a member of the condo association, the homeowners association uh, for the apartment. And but then I join the board of the homeowners association. And, and it's like it's partly because in France, it's as many of you know, I mean, it takes just like friendships and relationships are defined so differently uh, that it takes a long time to get people to open up. And so I had already many friends in Paris area and some outside. Uh, but in my building, there'd be these people I would see every single day. And they would mostly like turn, avert their gaze and uh, hardly exchange a greeting. And so by joining the condo association, suddenly it was this way of cracking open this little world of our building and, and understanding all of the little like the internecine battles over space and, and everything else. So it was really just, it was just kind of fun. Uh, a, a contrast with that is uh, the building that I'm in now is, uh, it's, it's a condo, not unlike the building in, in Paris, but here at the end of the first day, I knew everybody, uh, they, they would stop me on the stairs. I'd be like carrying a lamp up and they'd say, wait a minute, you're Scott Carpenter, aren't you? Didn't you just move in? Don't you teach at, it's like, my goodness, you know, word spreads like wildfire. Not only did I know them, but I knew their dogs. And end of day one. Uh, so this is this is. I, I think it would be it would be like if I brought Sabine here and said, "Oh, look!" And you get to meet everybody in the building, and they're going to want to. Oh my goodness! Yeah, this would yeah. be uh, hard to bear. I think. Um, yeah, and and. Uh, bringing Jerome, right, the guy from my, my local, like, so-called French hardware store, the Bricorama, and then dropping him in a Home Depot, uh, or even better, I would say, like, one the, the best hardware store in downtown St. Paul, where people know things and they, like, pull out a single uh, cotter pin and say, this is the thing that you need. I was like, not, not the way that French do things. So uh, there would be a certain amount of marveling, I think, um, at some of the differences. At the same time, at the same time, I think that uh, overall, the French response or the Parisian response to something like the Midwest would be the same as the Parisian response, some Parisians response to uh, the provinces, right? So people would say, I love the provinces. They're wonderful for a vacation, yeah. right? Um, not to live there, maybe. Not to, not to live there. Um, so, you know, people heading out for their weekend in Normandy, or maybe they still have a family home in Burgundy or something like that. It's great right. to have that for a few days, or right. maybe up to a month, something like that. Um, people always like enjoy, they come to the Midwest and it's uh, vast, right? Mm -hmm. they, they're just impressed by the vastness right. of it. And you think of, compare that to uh, Paris, which is one of the most densely populated cities in the world. It's more densely populated than uh, than Bangkok or, or right. uh, Shanghai, right? It's very densely populated. And here there's, we don't, we don't have a lot, but we got space. 
Right, right, exactly. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah. That was fun. Um, I wondered if when you returned to the Midwest after you lived there for a year this time, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, returned, right, right. Mm -hmm. When you returned, did you have any uh, reverse culture shock? Yeah, so I mean, I have to say, I've done this uh, a number of times, and 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 the book is um, uh, focusing on when we when we bought the apartment. But of course, as a teacher of French and French literature, I've been going to France for uh, for ages and often for for long periods of time. Um, and uh, and I guess what surprises me is that it's still so it's it's always a shock going right. There's an adjustment period to. It might just be a day or two to sort of like recalibrate and uh, and everything, but it also happens on the return trips, especially after mm -hmm. um, after these uh, these extended stays. And I think it's uh, I don't know. I think it's sort of healthy, right? It shows that you you turn the other place into home. It's you've changed your standards, you've adjusted everything, and then when you uh, come back to the states or whatever then you are you have to reset the dials and it's kind of like changing the clocks or, or something yeah. you have to do I that think in it, the broader it, culture it very sense. much illuminates our home culture i think when we return to it because we notice things in it that in our daily lives we sort of have sort of passed unnoticed right time, you know yeah. um I mean, i think so travel what, has the advantage of making us like malcontents wherever we are yeah. <laughs> right. That you, you get to Paris, you say, "Oh, it's just so great to have this," but what about that? Then you get back home, it's like, "Oh, thank goodness, I'm back to this." But what about that other thing? So, yeah. I love that. <laughs> um, so, what I admire about your writing is that you seem to like. One of the things that I, when I go there, I pretty much like as soon as I get on the plane to come there, I just leave the states behind. Like, I'm just like, okay. But you seem to have this ability to always hold both cultures, you know, in each of your chapters, in each of your stories, like you have both the Midwestern culture and the Parisian culture in front of you. Um, and then you kind of ask, like you sort of toss out this question in the book, um, do we become them or do they become us? And, um, you know, I don't think they're they're not particularly interested in becoming us right now. <laughs> but um, I wonder if you felt like you took on the culture a little bit, and also uh, maybe expand on the way that it changed you. Like I feel like every single time I go there, there's a new thing that I kind of bring home with me right. that makes my life different. Um, so maybe talk about like, if you ever felt like you went from being an outsider to kind of an insider, maybe in the condo board, maybe when you made the coca van, <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> but, um, if you've ever felt like you went, like you, like you took on part of that culture that you retained and you still have in your life now. Yeah. Um, uh, good question. Um, you know, so thinking back to that idea of that that dilemma, right? Do we become them or do they become uh, us? Uh, and in a sense, that goes back to a uh, a particular little anecdote in the book where a colleague of mine, her, uh, she's there with her daughters and her two young daughters go to French schools. They're plop, plopped into French schools. And the first one comes back and mom says, you know, well, how, how was it today? It's like, oh my goodness, it's so, so hard. I'm just like, I, I'm beating down all of the French. How am I gonna do this? The second one comes back, the younger one. It's like, how was school? Her hands are on her hips. And she says, well, it was a lot of work, but by the end of the year, I think I'll have taught them English, right? So it's like, how much are we supposed to be working to move into that space? How much are we trying to pull people into our space and, and everything? Um, and uh, so I, I think uh, if you're right, if in these chapters I do have uh, Parisianness and Midwesternness side by side, um, I, I take that as a as a compliment, right? What what yeah, I'm hoping is, is that there's 
what I'm hoping is that there is a kind of a binocular vision going on here, and that um, that the two sides actually illuminate each other. Uh, that the experience that I have, right? We we all experience cities differently, just as we all read books differently, right? I'll read a book and it'll touch me in a way that it doesn't necessarily touch you. And I'll go to Paris and, and because I'm shaped in a particular way, I have a particular experience of that city, but also like books, right? The, the book also changes me. So the, the, the experience of Paris then changes my way of being and, and also my experience of the Midwest back. And it helps me, I think that when people go abroad and live abroad, uh, they learn language, they learn culture, but they also learn a lot about the place they left behind. Mm -hmm. um, so the hope is that there would be this kind of echoing, I guess, back and forth. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that's, I feel like you achieved that. I feel like it's a, that it's quite a coup and you, you achieved it in the book. And I congratulate you on that. It's, I think it's <laughs> awesome. Um, I was wondering, and I think this is my last question because we're going to hand it off for the questions, but um, I was wondering if you always intended to write a book about this experience and I'm wondering what surprised you in, you know, I found like with my wings book, I was always perpetually surprised, um, when I was writing each chapter and then when I put the chapters together, just about what the experience meant to me. And, um, and, and, and I really didn't get a sense of what that book was until it had probably been out for about six months and I'd been talking about it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I think it's really about how I, how I arrived in France and found everything I happened to need at that point in my life. And I thought, it's France, it's France, it's France, when it was really sort of what I needed. So I just wondered if you can talk a little bit about, about what the process of writing the book and, and uh, presenting the book has, yeah. has enlightened you about your own experience. Yeah, so the first part of the question was about, you know, whether I had a particular goal that I was uh, trying to accomplish. And I think, uh, in a sense, I did. I think, as in your situation, I think the the um, the it didn't crystallize right away, right? Um, but I take it all back to uh, uh, episode several years ago when I was uh, hired to uh, uh, accompany a French group of tourists, and um, this was in the southwest. And I, I wasn't the tour guide; I was just there to help, like translate and uh, mediate a little bit and entertain, sort of like a jester or something like that. And um, so I was there and, and the thing had been put together by this tour operator where everything was like hyper organized and they'd be, we'd be like driving down the road and she'd whisper to the chauffeur and say, oh, stop the bus at the next corner because that's where the geese are. And that's where we always take the picture. And we'd go to the Chateau of Baynac and she'd tell people, be sure to go up the left stairs to the southwest corner of the tower because that's where you get the view of the valley. And, you know, they take us to the folkloric dance that, only exists for tourists and everything else. I'm sort of like drumming my fingers through all of that. And the penultimate day, we, we go to a farm where they're, um, they're uh, force feeding geese to make foie gras, right? And you know how that's done the funnel in the gullet and they're shoving grain in. And suddenly I have this illumination. I think, my God, that's what they've been doing to us for the past 10 days. They've been <laughs> shoveling cliches down a funnel into our brain. And, and we went, we returned to the hotel that day and people got off the bus and they're putting away their, gus, uh, their goose paraphernalia and their postcards and suddenly cries ring out in the hotel. And uh, it turns out that while we were out, the hotel was burgled and, and the wall safes were ripped out of the walls. People had lost their money and their passports and their airline tickets and jewelry and you know people running up and down the halls the hotel owner like wringing his hands and the gendarme come piling out of the, the little car like clowns out of a, yeah, so, and, and it's total mayhem. And I think, my goodness, this is, this is, uh, this is what I love about this situation. It's the first time that reality has erupted uh, in, uh, to pierce the uh, cliche armor of, of this experience. And that's when I understood that what I really wanted to do was write 
a book that would somehow uh, break through the, the crust of those cliches. Oh, awesome. Well, kudos to you because I think you did just that. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, thank See, you so, yeah. so much, Dan. Should we go ahead and move to questions? Sorry, did I cut you off, Scott? No, I was just wondering if we were supposed to be moving to you at this point. We yeah. are moving to me. Here I am. Thank you, Erin, for the wonderful interview. You're welcome. Okay, so we are getting some questions already, which is fantastic. And I'll just remind everyone, please do submit them in the chat and we'll get to as many as time allows. Um, so I've got one right away that's for Scott. So can you debunk one myth of Parisians and one myth of Midwesterners? Oh man, uh, right. So um, yeah, I guess, I mean, one of, one of the myths of uh, Midwesterners is that um, uh, they're like quiet, soft-spoken people or something. And, and I think that uh, there's, right, there's always a little truth to these things. But then what happens is that there is like this really wonderful sense of irony uh, in the Midwest. Right, people, people have this idea. There's this notion of Midwestern, Midwest nice, Minnesota nice, uh, things like that. It's like, no, there's like biting, caustic, interesting, tension-riddled things uh, going on, going on all of the time. Um, with respect to Paris, I would say, man, it's like pick one, pick anything. Uh, so, so Paris is Paris has been produced by like the, the Paris Tourist Board and the Chamber of Commerce as this sensual, uh, sophisticated, eroticized place, right? And it's eroticized to the, you know, because you think of the, the way the Galerie Lafayette used to do the, their poster of the Eiffel Tower as a woman with a dress, uh, the image of the RATP, the rapid transit, which looks like a little map of Paris, but oh, it's actually also the profile of a woman um, the, the way that Marianne is like integrated in all of these various things. So um, that is the image that sells. And, and I think it is like not at all the Paris that people live in. Uh, so yeah, I, my place where, where I live in Paris is in the 13th arrondissement. It's like old, old working class kind of place, a lot of rough edges. And I love it. And it's certainly not the kind of Paris that people are, um, it is being promoted by the, the Tourist Bureau. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so we have another question that's, that's about some of your previous work. So this person is wondering if you could say a little bit about uh, your other book based in France, Theory of Remainders, um, which she believes is a different genre. <laughs> well, she's right about that, yeah. So Theory <laughs> of Remainders is, is a, um, it's a novel it's set largely in Normandy. It does have a French-American connection. So the protagonist is uh, an American psychiatrist uh, who is returning to France after many years um, uh, to try to resolve a family trauma. So he lost his daughter, uh, who was born and raised in France uh, several years earlier. Um, and uh, so it is, it's strange. It does actually have some connections to French like moi in, uh, the kinds of cultural observations, but it's also a, a it's a serious a serious novel, um, and and um, with serious questions of history and and trauma and personal loss and and things like that. Um, there is one character in Theory of Remainders who has the kind of joyous spirit that comes across in in French like moi, uh, Roger, um, but yeah, otherwise a very different book. Okay, great. And this one is about uh, inspiration. So the person is wondering if you were inspired by the Lettre Persan of Montesquieu. Yeah, right. So that's a, um, a very scholarly question, uh, right? For, for people who don't know, uh, this is Montesquieu, the 18th century writer, uh, writes the, the Persian letters, the Lettre Persan, and, um, which is one of the quintessential uh, travel books, right? Books of, uh, of like cultural clash um, that is also quite quite ironic, quite mordant at, at many turns, uh, but also has some some serious angles that it's uh, taking on. But it's also it's it's a work of fiction, um, whereas mine is even though I've like maybe sanded some of the edges down uh, on mine, mine is uh, mine is not. 
Um, I would say in terms of like literary precedents, um, I'm much more attached to a 19th century precedent, which is uh, Charles Baudelaire's uh, Spleen de Paris. It's the, uh, the Spleen of Paris, the, it's translated sometimes as the Parisian Prowler, a uh, series of um, short anecdotes. They're actually considered prose poems, these vignettes of life in, uh, in Paris. Great, thank you. Uh, so the next question is, would you say that your knowing the French language has proven to be an asset in cross-cultural dialogue or has it irritated you at times? I'm kind of intrigued by this one. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not quite sure what sort of irritation it would produce. Um, but yeah, I mean, overwhelmingly, yes, it's an asset. I think that the, um, you know, as a kid, uh, so I'm like, it's a Midwesterner in Paris, but I'm like Midwestern in many respects, but not all. I, I uh, grew up for, I uh, had a few years of my childhood in London. And uh, so there were school trips to Paris and, and things like that. And I think very early on, I realized how much it bothered me that I was not able to deal with other people on their own terms. Uh, and I think actually then spending the rest of my childhood in the US and, um, and uh, yeah, dealing with the sense that Americans often expect others to, uh, to deal with us on our terms, uh, that, that it became important to me. I mean, it's just like interesting and fun, but also important to me to be able to interact with others in their language. And so French is the one that I'm the most proficient in, and it's the one that I interact uh, in the most, but it's um, uh, very definitely an asset. Does, doesn't mean that there aren't little like quirks of language in French or English that I find troublesome. Yeah, and how did you end up getting, I'm just waiting for more questions to come here, come in here, asking yeah. one of my own. Um, who was sort of your your main, you know, maybe teacher for some of this insider vocabulary that you get into? Because, you know, I've been here for four years, maybe that's not such a long time, but I like to think my French is pretty good. And then I was sort yeah. of like, wow, spending only a year here, how do you, how do you get that level of, of insight <laughs> into the language? It was impressive. Yeah, but yeah, as, as I mentioned before, uh, so this, this deals with the, uh, principally with the year when we settled in, but it actually, some of the stories go beyond that. And um, and I'd spent many years in France, you know, working in various capacities, starting out as a student. And, um, but for the most part, what I found is that the, the trick is to throw myself into situations where I have almost no expertise, uh, but responsibilities. And so I, I don't have the option of like not doing things, uh, suddenly I'm expected to perform in some particular way. And so if I'm with a group, suddenly I have to figure out how to like order, rent a bus. And I, I, I need to, you know, figure out how to do group tickets with the, uh, the SNCF and, and things like that. Um, and yeah, uh, it's just, uh, if I'm going to tackle a home remodeling project, then I've got to go and like chat with Jérôme and uh, I suddenly learn all of these wonderful things. So as, as most people find uh, when they're straddling these cultures, there are certain things that you find you can, uh, you can do in your native tongue that you can't do in the foreign language, but then at some point, vice versa, you've learned things in French that you are no longer quite, or you never quite learned in, in English. So you just are in like a pickle, no matter where you go. Yeah, I relate to that too. I think especially the sink or swim mentality, you know, that's the best way to do it. It's just you, you have to learn. There's no way out. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. So it's certainly true of, you know, just like language teaching, right? That notion of total immersion. Right. But I think that's also how we learn culture, getting thrown into it. Great. So we do have another question. Um, it's somebody who's wanting you to speak to Americans' fascination with France and the fascination the French have for America. I guess that's a, that's a pretty open-ended question, but I'll give you... I'll give you a little bit of time there. Yeah, I don't know. It's such a it's such a puzzle, isn't it? It's this love hate relationship, uh, which is true with many relationships based on fascination and based on misunderstanding that we all like misunderstand one another at some point at some level. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, some some people remember the years of uh, freedom fries in the US when oh. right, France had not followed along the US in its, uh, um, let's call it international, like 
imperialist uh, uh, steps. And, and so suddenly we were not allowed to have French fries anymore. It was imperial fries. There was the story when uh, John Kerry uh, made the cardinal mistake of responding to a, a question by a French reporter in French. And, and suddenly he was decried by uh, Americans as as being somehow like un-American because you could. So there's this strange relationship we have where people like somehow uh, venerate the French and especially Paris, I guess, are infatuated with it. But they're also very like standoffish about it. We, we love it, but not too much. And um, so, yeah, I don't have a good explanation for this. People would have to go back to Tocqueville or something, right? Uh, um, which I think is still very, very pertinent. But um, uh, but it's it's enduring this love hate relationship. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, that brings us kind of up to time here, but. Thank you both again very much for this wonderful conversation. Thank you to the audience for your questions this evening. Um, this is kind of the point where I'd normally show you my copy. Um, I did read the book. I loved it very, very much, but I read it on my iPad. So <laughs> I won't be able to, I read it as a PDF. So thank you, Scott, also for the access. There we go. Here, here's what it looks like for those who can't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for modeling for us. So Happy I have to gone ahead so. and dropped the I've dropped the link to your website, Scott, in the chat in case anybody wants to check out some more of your work or even order the book. I think there's many opportunities to do so there. Um, and then just to close up, I wanted to um, remind everybody that the American Library in Paris is a nonprofit. And so if you're interested in donating or supporting the library, um, you know, traditionally in person, we welcome about 10 euros for events. So if you've enjoyed tonight's event, um, feel free to visit that link that I sent out uh, in my email with the Zoom link. It's, you'll find it just above, there's an opportunity to donate. Um, and otherwise, we hope to see you again very, very soon. We're still continuing virtual events for the time being. Just to highlight one, and here I do have a have a model. This is maybe sort of unfair, but so we'll be hosting Amor Tolls. Um, he's going to be speaking about A Gentleman in Moscow, which was, of course, tremendously popular. Um, and that is on the 16th of December. So head to our homepage or the programs calendar if you're interested in signing up for that. And otherwise, um, have a wonderful evening or afternoon for those of you joining us from the States. And thank you again to Aaron and Scott for joining us. Thank you thank so you. very much. And I uh, hope people will uh, order early and order often. And always very helpful if people uh, post reviews. We all depend on word of mouth. Absolutely. Thank you both. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.